All right, so I guess he's he's just trying to make sure that Steve is prayed up. He made him start out this morning as well. Uh, so, so, but, but that's okay. I need it, he, he, needs, he, needs, he needs to pray, and we all do. He's almost there. Uh, so, another couple of times tonight, and he'll, be, he'll have it done. All right, grab your hymn along if you would, please. Turn to number 327. Number 327. Let's go to 372. Number 372. Happy to home. God is there. And one. 
Good to see everyone out tonight. And Brother Stan was talking about picking people to who to pray. And if you ever wonder how that works, it's completely random. Uh, I never make a plan with that. Mostly I just look around whoever I see first. Uh, so if you want to pray, stand up big and tall and you'll probably get called on. But kind of reminded me of, of several years ago. Uh, I guess I've been surrendered almost seven years now. So it have been eight or nine years ago. Well, probably been eight years ago. Uh, we at, In Arkansas, we were members of a church and it would come hunting season in October. And this is not a joke. Literally every man vanished except me and the preacher. And so I did the morning devotional. I helped. I, t I taught the adult Sunday school class. I took up the offering and said the opening prayer. I then said the closing prayer. That night, I did the morning opening devotional for the night service. I took up the night offerings. We had offerings on both nights. I taught the BTC adult class and then did the closing prayer. And at the end of the day, the preacher joked, our pastor joked, he said, boy, we've worked you today. And that's when I made the joke that I've often wondered maybe I shouldn't have made. I said, well, I did every job in the church but preach, and I'm not doing that. And it wasn't but maybe about 10 months later <laughs> that God made me eat those words. So, um, you know, we do what we got to do, right? So, anyway, I don't know why I thought of that. All right, tonight, if you want to be turning to Proverbs chapter 22 and verse 6, we are looking at kind of the question of why. Why are we doing Bible school? Why, why are we putting in the time? Why are we putting in the effort? Why are we putting in the hours and the sweat and the tears and the, the energy and the effort and all this stuff? Because if you've walked to the back or watched Mallory's video as she walked everyone to the back, or if you volunteered to teach or volunteered to do crafts or games or food or uh, any other part of it, uh, you have, or I pray that you are mentally preparing for a long week, uh, a beneficial week, a wonderful week, but a long week. Uh, we're not going to disguise that. And so maybe the question might have been asked, why? why? Why are we putting in the effort? Why are we going through the trouble? Why are we decorating? Why, why have they built castles? Even though I think it completely, if you notice, I match, you know, <laughs> well, I think it looks awesome for me to stand in a castle. Seems appropriate. I mean, I'm very kingly, you know, but uh, why? Why did we put... Why? I said you were a princess earlier, dear. Mallory said you could also be the jester. I could be the court jester. Well, that might work, too. Uh, I could be the food taster, I guess. I don't know, but... Why? 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 Why are we doing this? Why? Why? Why are we putting the effort? I mean, we could we could have skipped it this year and just stayed at home and caught up on sleeping or whatever. Why? Why do we put forth the effort? So we're looking at Proverbs chapter 22 amongst several other verses. Uh, so why? So let's go ahead. If you want to stand for the reading of the word, you may do so now. Proverbs 22 and verse 6. The Bible tells us, it says, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this night and this opportunity to come to your house, to be uh, with your people, to be studying your word. And Father, we thank you for the good times and the fun that we can have, but we also thank you for the lessons that we will learn, uh, that the Bible will be illuminated, that we will understand why uh, we put forth an effort teaching uh, everyone your word, why it's so important, why it's important to sacrifice for the children, Lord. We just pray for each name that's been lifted up, each request that's on each heart, those who are sick, those who are lost loved ones, and those who are traveling, Lord, each and every need, uh, we just lift them up to you, Father, and asking for strength and comfort. And Father, we ask that you be on our nation, Lord, and our state and our county, our city, Lord, just that you would just lead our leaders to come to believe in you, Lord, that maybe we would take the opportunity somehow to reach them or that they might hear the word preached somehow, that they might come to know Christ. And 
Father, we would pray that through Bible school, that uh, if there be one who comes this week that doesn't know Christ, maybe one here tonight that does not know Christ, that your word would be preached and illuminated and the Spirit would draw them and that they might believe and trust in him and that souls would be saved, Lord, as we know the end is approaching, Lord. We pray for a revival that, that millions might be saved before the end reaches. But Father, we do praise you knowing that when the end comes, Christ is coming back and we will forever be with him. Father, we just pray that you touch each heart, and when we leave here tonight, we are revived and excited and ready to serve you throughout the week, for we ask it all in Jesus' name, amen. So Proverbs 22 and 6, and, and Proverbs is a book of wisdom written by Solomon, the wisest man, because God had blessed him with that. We know that there are exceptions to every rule. There are instances where some individuals, some children are, are taught 100% correctly and yet they still go astray. We know that Satan was an angel that went astray. We know that Judas had the greatest preacher for three years and he went astray. We know there's always those exceptions which prove the rule. But looking at the general idea or the general rule of Proverbs 22 here and verse 6, it just lets us know it says, train up a child or teach a child, or raise up a child in the way they should go, how they should act, what they should do. When he is old, he will not depart from it. There's a reason we teach the youth. There's a reason that secular the world teaches kids. Why do you think we teach kids from the time uh, they're, they're now three? They're trying to get kids crammed into schools because they teach them some things they need, some things they probably don't need, but they know that you teach a child and it will stick. From the day I was born, I was taught how to call the Razorbacks and that will never change. Uh, love it, hate it, indifferent, doesn't matter. That's not going to change. I went, we've went through some of the worst years and possibly sports history, and, and if you're raised that way, you're still going to call them. That's a secular idea. But, but that's the reason we teach kids. That's why we have Sunday school classes. That's why we encourage kids to come and listen to preaching. Uh, I know, you know some people have different ideas on that. I think kids should be out in the preaching service to hear God's Word preached, to teach them how to set, to teach them how to listen, to teach them it's important to hear God's Word because you never know when that child... I've seen seven and eight-year-olds get saved from hearing God's Word. You never know. We, we bring kids. We, we teach kids. That's why we don't allow kids... Uh, and I've, horrible. I've heard parents or grandparents, well, I, I let my children decide if they want to come or not. That's, that's crazy. You know, when, when I grow up, when we were growing up or I was growing up, I knew if it was Sunday, we were going to church. That's just what you did. And we teach. And why, why are we putting forth the effort? It's because we want them to know the truth. The, the children today, and, and looking around, a lot of y'all are slightly more um, what's a good proper word for that experienced seasoned older um, mature um, yeah there's there's some wonderful uh, wonderful ideas there so y'all y'all are in a slightly different generation but even my generation compared to their generation we didn't face half of what they faced and y'all didn't face a lot of the things my generation faced we must teach the kids the truth of God's Word today because the school system, call it what it is, is openly trying to teach them against that. School systems try to teach evolution, which, by the way, even in Darwin's book, called it a theory. A theory is something that can't be proven. It's an idea. Schools are trying to teach evolution as a fact. The Big Bang as a fact. All, all these different, you know, 15 different genders or 67 genders is fact. Some schools are even teaching kids how to pray uh, on Muslim prayer rugs and bringing religion in that way. They're teaching them to have atheistic groups and they're teaching witchcraft and they're teaching this. They're teaching homosexuality. They're teaching sex ed to five-year-olds. If we don't teach them God's word, the world isn't going to. And if we're not going to teach them the truth, and that's why parents and grandparents have to be involved because even if we get blessed with a child here all week, they're fixing to start school in two weeks. One week if you're going to the city schools. Two weeks if you're going to the county schools. They're going to have them five days a week, seven, eight hours a day, and that's if they don't do after school activities on Wednesdays and Sundays and every other day. We must teach children the truth. We must teach them God's word. We must teach them the right from the wrong, uh, what is correct, what is incorrect. This is going to be uh, almost 
hateful to, to some people. Yes, I put the greatest puns on Facebook. I do like Facebook for puns. But if I could somehow, you remember those staples at Staples, the commercial had those easy buttons? That was easy. Yeah, I pushed it and it went off. <laughs> if I could have an easy button that would eliminate cell phones and laptops and iPads and all those things, I'd push it. And you're like, oh, no, no, no. Think about it. When 50, 10, 10, 20 years ago, we had to search for immorality. A child today can pick up a phone or a laptop in a couple of words and search, and they have the most sickening, disgusting stuff right in their face at their fingertip. Things that most of us could not even imagine, just a couple of words, and it can be right on your phone. And I know they have adult locks and this and that, but I'm sorry, parents, your children are smarter than you in electronics. If you put an adult lock, they'll get around it. Tell me I'm wrong. <laughs> and so if we could somehow do away with computers, laptops, all that immorality, TV, we, we would probably be better off. Elizabeth was talking earlier about watching TV that's not turned on, and I first thought that was crazy, and then the more I thought about it, I thought, you know what? That's probably healthier. Why do you think they called it TV programs? Why do you think even on Andy Griffith, when you finally find a good TV show, Andy Griffith, you ever watch that? The commercials are the most sickening thing you'll ever find. Every time we watch TV on the internet, we try to watch good, decent shows, the commercials always are about how great homosexuality is or how if you get sick from it, you can take a pill. The most disgusting, immoral junk crammed into your kids and I promise you I know every parent here thinks their child doesn't do it. Your child has picked up the phone or the laptop or some kind of computer and seen stuff you cannot imagine. Sickening. That's what the world is teaching. It's what the schools are teaching. The schools are trying to take the filth from the laptop and put it into the curriculum. We must teach them God's word. Have to. We are losing the fight because we're sitting back and not trying. We have to teach them the truth. So just a few random verses from the Bible about teaching children. Flip over uh, to Genesis chapter 18. Figured we might as well start in you know the first book and go book by book. Amen. Nobody. Okay. That's all right. You know, Wednesday night, Stan wanted me to go long so he could see the cross lit up, and now nobody wants to stay long. It's like, what in the world? By the way, we did make it Wednesday night. Genesis chapter 18, look at verse 19. We see Abraham, the Lord talking about Abraham in Genesis 18 and 19. God says, For I know him, speaking to Abraham, that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he has spoken of him. Notice one of the things. We know Abraham, Father Abraham, picked and was loyal and was faithful. Was he perfect? No, he sinned. We've seen, we can see all through that. But notice what God says about him here. He says that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord. One of the, probably the greatest thing that could be said of any man, woman, or parent is the fact that they taught and led their children in the Lord. He's like, well, you know, I, I promise you there are parents that spend thousands of dollars and countless hours getting their child to every little league game in the country, but it's too exhausting to get them to church on Sunday. I, I remember reading a Bible verse that says to store up treasures, you know, in heaven, not on earth. If your little league child is the greatest player in history, and I don't know any, I'll pick little league, but I don't know any baseball players other than Babe Ruth. But uh, if you somehow was the greatest baseball player of all time, and they lived their life as a big celebrity and made millions of dollars, and they got their name on every card and billboard in the Wheaties box, if that's even still a thing but they died without knowing Christ. What have you accomplished? What does the Bible say? What does a man gain if he gaineth the whole world and loseth his soul? Which is more important? The Bible says Abraham is going to teach his children, and we know he does. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, on and on and on through the genealogies. We are here today because someone taught you. 
We are here today because someone took time to teach you, maybe as a parent, maybe as a Sunday school teacher, maybe it was a song director, maybe it was somebody, but someone taught you. And so today, and for the next week, and for the next 10 years, and however far it goes, we are going to take the time to teach somebody about Jesus. Right? That's why we do this. That's why, we, that's why we're excited. That's why next Sunday, everyone here is going to drag in a little bit grayer, maybe a little bit balder, maybe a few more wrinkles, but we're going to drag in here joyfully rejoicing because we served God all week and taught some child something about Him. It's going to be worth it. And every one of us puts forth an effort to do what we want to do. Let's put forth an effort to do what God wants us to do. So flip over to Deuteronomy. We ain't never going to get through all the books at this rate. I skipped a few books. Amen. Deuteronomy chapter 4, look at verse 9. We see this talking about the law, talking about Moses teaching the children. This is verse 9. It says, Only take heed to thyself and keep thy soul diligently, lest thou forget the things which thine eyes have seen, and lest thou depart from the heart all the days of their life. But teach them thy sons and thy sons' sons. We need to be teaching our sons. Flip over to chapter 6. Look at verse 7. Same book. Chapter 6. Verse 7, what does it say? It says, And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou settest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up, and thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes, and thou shalt write them upon the post of the house and on thy gates. Going back to verse uh, 7, Thou shalt teach them diligently. What if we literally taught our children diligently? When was the last time we sat down with a child, not a child, with your child or your grandchild or great-grandchild, I don't know, and actually taught diligently means we put forth a concerted effort to ensure that it happens. Going back to sports, how many hours will parents go out and play catch with a child? How many hours will you shoot basketball goals? How many hours will you teach them to swing? How many hours will you put forth in the gym giving them strength? How many hours do you put forth driving, driving, driving? And then have, what does the Bible say? We need to teach the children diligently the Word of God. What if we put those hours into teaching children? I, you got Aaron and Elizabeth and Mallory and Matthew and John. I think Matthew and John did great too, by the way. We saw what one day a week putting in the time teaching them God's Word can do to the fact that they advanced during the Bible challenge. That was one day a week. What if parents put forth efforts into teaching their children God's Word every day of the week? You know what? We wouldn't have half the problems we have in society. Stop teaching kids nonsense about monkeys and evolution and teach them God's Word and watch them put down the guns and pick up the Word of God. That's how we fix society. And so the word here in verse 7, it tells us to diligently teach thy children, shall talk of them when thou settest in thy house, when thou walkest by the way, when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. That doesn't leave a lot of time for TV, does it? And leave a lot of time for, for playing video games. And, you know, if you kept a child in the Word and focused on them instead of letting them run amok, and I, we, we we're all guilty of that. If a child is focused on the Bible, that child ain't got the filth on their phone that they're looking at. And we all know there's filth on your phone, on your laptops. It, it's, it's despicable what's there. Let's put children back into the Word of God. And most of us had that. If you didn't have that, you missed a blessing. That Those Sunday school lessons, Abraham, Jonah, Moses, Noah. I remember Bible schools from a, as a child. I, I remember, of course, we didn't have man, any of this stuff. You know what we had? We had a cookie and Kool-Aid and thought it was the greatest thing ever. <laughs> it was for a child. I was excited. We get a glass of Kool-Aid and a cookie every night. I mean, that was wonderful. But you know what? I also remember hearing lessons. I also remember singing uh, The Lily of the Valley of all things as one of my favorite songs just because I remember in Bible school, a man named David Martin was my teacher one year, and he, for some reason we had to learn that song in music class, and he made it so fun. I still love that song. 
Those things that make an impression on the youth. Children see and learn everything we do. We better make sure what we're doing points to God. Because they're going to learn one way or the other. If children see parents that don't care about the Lord, they're not going to care at all. And a lot of some of the reasons we're here is because parents, you know, went to church as a routine, but the kids, they didn't care. And where's the, where's my generation? (laughs) Not to be offensive, but where's the 20 to 40 year olds in the Lord's churches? It's time to get them back into church. You're still, I said 40, not 41. She had a smile on her face. Amen. Amen. We, we need that generation because the older generation, y'all can pray, you can work hard. Some of y'all can outwork us. But we need those 20 to 40 year olds. Let them do some time working. Where are they at? We need them in to teach them because they need to be taught. And if you look through these verses, it's all the time. Flip over to Psalm 78. Or the 78th Psalm. I had a stickler one time told me you have to say the 78th Psalm. You can't say Psalm 78. And I never did learn that lesson. I was like 30, though, when I was told that. You can't teach a 30-year-old much of nothing, can you? A couple of women out there are like, nope, can't teach husbands nothing either. That may be true. Psalm 78, looking at verse 3, says, Which we have heard and known, and our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from their children, showing to the generation to come the praises of the Lord, and His strength, and His wonderful works that He had done. For He established a testimony in Jacob, and appointed a law in Israel, which He commanded our fathers, that they should make them known to their generations, that the generations to come might know them, even the children which should be born, who should arise and declare them to their children. Why do we teach children? Because, A, we need them to learn and grow and mature and be grounded and, 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 and taught correctly about Jesus, but then that they can teach their kids, who can then teach their kids, who can then teach their kids, and on and on and on. It only takes one gap for thousands to fall out. You ever did a family tree, family genealogy, family history? I never have because I've always been a little bit worried that I might find out we were like from Alabama or something. But, but if you look at that family genealogy, you know, you start with just a couple and then there's like four and then eight and 16 and 32 and blah, 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 all the way up to thousands. Well, you knock out one limb of that, one area of that, one family decides, you know what, we ain't going to church, I don't believe in that. Then you've got thousands of generations coming after We see it in America today. America, a few hundred years ago, shut down on Sundays. The entire country shut down. It would have been unheard of to do anything on Sunday. Why? Because the whole country was at a church. And then slowly it started evolving. They started opening this, and Walmart opened that, and then the lake opened, and then schools started doing this and that and the other. And I don't know what the percentage is, but it ain't very many that go to church anymore. What does these tell us? It tells us we need to be teaching them so that their generation, I love that verse 6, that the generation to come might know them. Even the children which should be born. When Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, He prayed for those coming after. He prayed for you and I for thousands of years, all the way up from, well, technically Adam and Eve, but let's just go back to Jesus. Jesus started His church and they taught, who taught, who taught, who taught, who taught, who taught, all the way up to today. And we're going to teach today. And we're going to teach this whole week so that someone can learn the truth. Someone can get saved. Someone can be grounded because one day... The next generation's what's going to be teaching. I'd rather know I taught them the truth than left it up to just happenstance. Because happenstance, they ain't going to know nothing but nonsense. The whole idea I'll let my kid decide is one of the most hateful statements I could possibly imagine. If I stand here and say, I believe that there is an eternal heaven and there's an eternal hell called New City Jerusalem and Lake of Fire, but you get where I'm going. There are two choices and the only way to eternal heaven is through Jesus Christ by grace through faith. And I stand here and say, well, I'll let my child decide. Maybe they'll find out. I just said, I don't care if my child dies and goes to hell or not. That's all 
on them. I believe every child of God and every adult that knows the truth, we need to be teaching the children. That doesn't mean they're going to listen. They may ignore. They may be hard-hearted. It may take years. But we're going to do everything we can to teach them the truth because it's an eternal consequence. Can you imagine saying, I'll let my child figure it out and then they die and burn in hell for eternity because you were too lazy to care. And a lot of times that's what it boils down to. We are too lazy to care. It's time to quit taking them to Little League and start taking them to the Lord and teaching them the Word of God. Flip over to Ephesians chapter 6. Mallory, your clock over there is convicting me. It's burning a hole in the side of my head. You know what? What's that? There. Kill that thing. <laughs> that fixed it. <laughs> Easy button. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 4. It's a little bit convicting for fathers. It should be. Ephesians 6 and 4. And ye fathers provoke not your children to wrath, but look at this part. Bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Fathers, it is our responsibility to teach our children lots of things. We need to teach our sons how to be men. We need to teach our sons how to be gentlemen. That ought to be brought back. Chivalry is only dead because we're too lazy to teach it. We need to bring back being gentlemen. We need to teach our sons how to treat a woman correctly in the love of the Lord. We need to teach our daughters how to settle for nothing less than a man that will lead her to the Lord. And we need to be teaching our sons and daughters, everyone, this, to bring them up in the nurture and admiration of the Lord. It is our job as fathers to teach our children about the Lord. Now, like I said, you know, well, I, I, tr I can't teach my kids to call the hogs. They just, they're stubborn on that, and that bothers me a little bit. But even if I never convince them to call the hogs, the greatest thing we can ever do is teach them how to love the Lord. The highlight of my life, and my wife is hopefully understand this, our wedding day was great, but this was better. Not when the children were born, because that was a, whew, that was horrifying. Cost like six grand. All kinds. But so far, the highlight was on a Wednesday night when Mallory walked up and said, I want to get saved. So it wasn't her birthday that the highlight. It was the new birth that really mattered. You know, we celebrate our birthdays and we make big events and we have these, oh, you're turning 15 and 16 or 42 or whatever and we have parties and balloons and cake and that day doesn't mean nothing if we don't have a second birthday. The second birthday is the day we ought to celebrate. That's the day we're truly born. The first birthday just means we're born and we're eventually dying, burn in hell if we don't have that second birthday. And fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. We all probably have taught, one of the first verses I ever taught my child, it's not, I don't know if he'll get it on here or not, but if you back up to Ephesians 6 and 1, that was one of the first verses I ever taught my children. It says, children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. And boy, as a, as a church member, I was sat there grinning. Look what I taught my child. And then one day I kept reading. I got to verse 4. And you want to talk about a wake-up call? Uh-oh. That's responsibility. That means, yeah, children need to obey your parents and the Lord. By the way, the whole verse, children obey your parents and the Lord, I thought it was neat, children obey your parents. It's in the Lord part that matters. Why? Because parents need to be in the Lord to teach their children about the Lord. The parents don't need to be dropping their kids off at church. Parents need to be going in and learning and growing and eventually teaching. We need everyone. Flip over to 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. And look at verse 14. 2 Timothy chapter 3, look at verse 14. It says, But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, 
and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Jesus Christ. Ephesians 6, 4 said fathers, but Timothy's father didn't teach him nothing, but we can look at Timothy's mom taught him. And look at this testimony that Paul writes about Timothy. That from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures. That's better than teaching a child the alphabet. That's better than teaching them calculus or algebra or science or any other mumbo-jumbo garbage class. The only thing that truly, truly matters first and foremost is teaching your child the Holy Scriptures. If your child's the smartest rocket science heart surgeon but he doesn't know the Scriptures, you've wasted your entire potential to teach him. That thou hast known the holy scriptures. And those wise is which are able to make thee wise unto salvation. There is no way a person gets saved without hearing the word of God preached. Because how can they hear without a preacher? How can they preach without the word of God? It's the scriptures. The holy scriptures. So let's look at one example. That was the introduction. Let's look at one example real quick. Flip back to 1 Samuel. It'll be real quick. I like that teacher's meeting this morning. Are y'all excited for Bible school? Me too. I'm excited for Bible school, and I had a two-hour nap this afternoon. Well, I'm excited tonight. 1 Samuel chapter 1 and verse 28. We're going to see that the we could go into a lot more details about Samuel, how his mom had prayed and promised God, if you give me a child, I'll dedicate him to the temple and, and dedicate him to you. And God blessed her and gave her a child. So she did dedicate him to, to the temple. And so we see here in 1 Samuel, we're going to be looking at Samuel, 1 Samuel verse 1 and 28, or chapter 1 28, says, Therefore also I have lent him to the Lord. As long as he liveth, he shall be lent to the Lord. And he worshiped the Lord there. She took him and dedicated him to the Lord. It was still his decision. But she dedicated her child to God because she knew it was a blessing. She knew it come from God. And she knew the most important thing she could do was take him to the Lord. Boy, if we had parents today that would dedicate their children to the Lord. No matter what else. Oh, well, my little child's a prodigy in this and a prodigy in that. Great. Do they know the scriptures? So Samuel here, Samuel here, he gets dedicated to the Lord. And then look at chapter 2, verse 26. It says, And the child Samuel grew on and was in favor both with the Lord and also with men. He was well known, well thought of, well believed. But the best part there, favor both with the Lord. You bring your child to the Lord, dedicate him to the Lord, teach him the scriptures, teach him the word, watch him grow in the Lord, and watch him find favor with the Lord. The greatest thing we can see is our children saved, and then see them baptized and be active church members, and see them grow, and see them sing, and see them participate, and see them who knows what the sky's the limit in serving God. And so the mom brought the child, the child was dedicated, the child grew, so he found favor with the Lord. Now flip over to chapter 12. Chapter 12 and verse 2. 1 Samuel chapter 12 and verse 2. Talking about Samuel. And now behold, the king walketh before you, and I am old and gray-headed. Time out. That's what I should have said earlier. When I was looking for the word, I should have been like, everyone's old and gray-headed. I mean, that's biblical. You can't be offended at the Bible. Well, I guess you could, but you're offended to God. I love that. Anyway, go back to verse 2. And now behold, the king walketh before you, and I am old and gray-headed. And behold, my sons are with you, and I have walked before you from my childhood unto this day. Behold, here I am, witness against me before the Lord and before his anointed, whose ox have I taken. Yada, 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 yada. Notice what he said. Samuel said, I've walked before you. Since my childhood. So we have this child who was dedicated to the Lord, who chose to grow in admiration of the Lord, in favor with the Lord, and who stood before all the people since his childhood because he was taught the truth of the Lord. Does that know what Proverbs 22 and 6 is talking about? Raise up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he shall not depart from it. If you wonder, 
what I need to do with my child teaching the Word of God. If you're wondering what I need to do this week, brain someone to let us and help us teach them the Word of God. Why? Because if it sticks and that child stays, the greatest thing they can ever do, the greatest thing you can ever do, is to bring your children to the Lord and see them grow and learn and stay in the Word of God. That's why we're going to endure. That's why we're going to work. That's why hours have been put in. That's why countless sacrifices have been made. That's why when this week is over, more sacrifices will be made. That's why we're going to be here next Sunday. That's why we have a van. That's why we're trying to reach people. Because we must teach people about Jesus Christ. So tonight if you're here and you don't know Christ as your Savior, it's time to wake up. It's time to realize that Jesus loves you. You know, I know that's a, that's a Bible school song, Sunday school song. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the what? Bible tells me so. Well, the Bible tells you that you are loved by the Savior. He loved you so much that he gave his only begotten son, his only life on the cross. He went to the cross. He took the nails. He took all the pain. He took all the torture. He took the sins of the world, including your sin. And then three days later, he rose out of the grave. Tonight, he's sending the Spirit to convict you, to tell you that you need him. If you will just wake up and believe that you're a sinner and believe that he's the Savior and simply call upon his name, Jesus, I realize I'm lost. Please save me. The moment you believe in us is the exact second that you will be saved. Whether it's tonight or five minutes from now or wherever, believe and trust in Christ and you will be saved. You will have eternal security. You will be saved forever. You will have an eternal home not in the burning pit of the lake of fire, but an eternal home with Christ. Wake up. Believe. That's why parents teach your children. Grandparents teach your grandchildren. Somebody teach somebody about the love of Jesus Christ because His blood was shed on the cross and it's sufficient to pay for the sins of the world. And so we need to tell the world that their debt has been paid. Wake up and believe and it's yours. It's free. It's there. You don't have to die and burn. You can believe and live with Christ. And a child of God, you're saved. You've been saved for years. Maybe you've been teaching for years. Maybe you've been serving for years. There's still room for you to participate in them. Whether it's bringing someone, whether it's teaching, whether it's praying for someone, whatever. If you're here, you can participate in the work of the Lord. We need solid folks telling people about Jesus. So as the song leader comes and the musicians come tonight, if you're here and you're lost, you need to wake up. You need to realize that Christ has died for you. You need to realize that He is your Savior. Realize that He already loves you. Realize that all you have to do is believe it. You, you, you don't have to work for it. You don't have to earn it. You'll never deserve it. Just tonight, this second, you're under conviction. All you have to do is believe and ask. And no matter who you are or where you are, no matter not, all you do is believe and it's yours. He has never told a person no when they honestly sought salvation. He's never said, nope, not today. Nope, not you. Oh, don't you remember how bad you were a few months ago? No, he's never said any of that. No matter who you are or what you've done, when you believe in the name of Christ, you're saved immediately. He washes all our sins away. No matter who you are. So wake up tonight, believe and trust. As we stand, I don't know everybody's heart. I don't know what your needs are. I don't know if you've backslidden. I don't know if you need to. I don't know, but God knows. Go to Him. Get it right with Him. Lord, I want to be more faithful. Lord, I want to serve. Lord, I want to teach. Lord, I want to give. Lord, I want to tithe. Lord, I want to... Whatever, go to Him. You don't have to stay where you're at. You can move closer to Him. 
And he'll hold your hand. We saw this morning in Hebrews. He described as he led the children of Egypt or Israel out of Egypt. He said, I led them by the hand. You have access to the hand of the creator of the world. If you'll just reach out and grab it. And then he'll hold your hand. And wherever you go, he's with you. I don't know your hearts. I don't know your needs. But the answer is found in Christ. Go to him tonight as we sing.